Our Old Testament reading this morning follows the reading from last week in which Hagar and Ishmael were sent away. This morning we're reading from chapter 22 of Genesis, reading verses 1 through 14. So let us attend to the word of God for us this morning. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? Lord our God, allow me to speak words that are from you. Allow each one of us to hear what is from you. And whatever is not from you, Lord, help us to set it aside and discard it so that you alone are glorified. In Christ's name, amen. So this must be one of the hardest passages in Scripture. I mean, it is just awful. We see God tell his servant to take his son and offer him up as a burnt offering to sacrifice his child to God. It's unimaginable. It's horrific. And we don't know what to do with it. But it is part of our scriptures And if you are like me, you believe that everything in Scripture is there on purpose and is there for our benefit. So what do we do with a passage like this? One thing that that religion scholars have done is to look at this passage and say, 
that it marks a transition in religion. It was the way that God showed Abraham that the practice that had been common throughout the world was common in Canaan, has been practiced by humanity pretty much for all time. The idea of human sacrifice, that that is not what the God of Abraham seeks. That practice of offering up human beings to appease the gods. There in Canaan, the practice of of sacrificing a child in the fire was not only unknown, or was not at all unknown, but was pretty common. And so Abraham, in hearing that command, was probably not as shocked as we are. But God let him know, this is not the way to worship me. This is not what I want. And so this passage, the scholars tell us, is is a story that marks that that transition, that, that change in a paradigm from human sacrifice to animal sacrifice. And that's all well and good. But it doesn't help me to sit with this passage a whole lot. I don't know about you. It is still awful that Abraham would hear this and would respond, that that God would say it in the first place. And yet I think there's more to this passage than just that, that transition from from an abhorrent way of worshiping to a a new way of worshiping. You see, there's some some odd wording, wording in this passage. Did you notice right at the beginning, God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. But we just read last week about Abraham's other son, the older son, Ishmael. And scripture is really clear that, well, Abraham loves Ishmael. So why on earth would God say that Isaac was his only son whom he loved? It clearly is not the case. And yet, it seems to foreshadow something that comes later in the story we get in scripture. Because when Jesus comes out of the water of baptism, God the Father speaks and says, this is my son, the only begotten, my beloved. Listen to him. Somehow this this passage seems to be foreshadowing, giving us a glimpse of what God will do in Jesus Christ. As we read on, we see that that Abraham cuts the wood, and what does he do with it? He sets it on Isaac's shoulders, and Isaac carries it up the mount. Just as the cross was laid on Christ's shoulders, and he carried it up to Golgotha. And as we go on, we see This this idea that Abraham says, we will come back, my son and I. He says to the servants, we're both coming back to you. And when Isaac asks, where's the lamb? He is told by Abraham that God himself will provide the lamb. And as we read on the story, we see that sort of, but there's no lamb provided. It's a ram. The lamb is yet to come. The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When we read this story and see what it foreshadows and and recognize how truly awful it is, when we try and put ourselves in, in Abraham's place 
and think how he must have felt the horror of offering up your child. It gives us a new sense of what God the Father has given for us in Jesus Christ. That God's only begotten Son was given because he loves us that much. And this passage helps us to understand the extent of that gift. It is a a representation of this transition away from human sacrifice, a foreshadowing and, and a help in understanding what God has done in Jesus but I think there's more. The fact is that that Abraham did what he was asked. And I can't imagine that. How would you respond if God told you to take your child and offer them up? And yet, he does. He does because he is assured that this will not be the end. He says to the servants, the boy and I are going to come back after we have worshipped. Somehow he believes that Isaac is going to be with him at the end of this episode. Because God has already promised that to him. God said to Abraham that your seed will be more than the sand on the shore, more than the stars in the sky, that you are going to have innumerable descendants and they will come through Isaac. And Abraham believes God. He has faith in God. He trusts him. Even though what God is asking him to do makes no sense at all. It is that reminder that if we believe in God's promises, we know that God is always good. We know that God can always be trusted, even when it makes no sense. Many of us have experienced those times where where in incredible hardship and suffering, we ask God, How? How can this possibly be? How can you take the life of this child? How can you let these people suffer? How can you let the world be the often awful place that it is? But if we had the faith that Abraham has, we would trust that even though we cannot understand it, that God has a plan. And it is better than what we could figure out. That in what happened here, Abraham was tested. And and we have the result of that test, that trial to look to. And to ponder, what if I could be like that? We see the result of his promise that Isaac is the child of the promise, and that through Isaac, there would be Jacob and Esau, and from Jacob, there would be the 12 patriarchs of Israel, and through the Israelites would come Jesus the Christ. We don't often understand God's plans. We can't perceive who God is We are mere human beings, and even the wisest and the smartest of us are clueless when it comes to what God is doing. And so we walk by faith. We walk by faith like Abraham did, trusting that the God we know in Jesus Christ is always good trusting that God's plans are better than ours, trusting that even though we don't understand, God is still in control. That, I think, 
is the real take-home from this passage. A challenge for us when we're going through those difficult times, when we are doubting God's goodness, when we are doubting God's plans, to look at what God has always done and always will do, that God is faithful and God is good and God can be trusted. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.